speaker for tonight. Thank you. Um, um, Becky Lavoie is the full-time education outreach specialist with the Ocean County Soil Conservation District, where she develops programs and instructs school children, scout groups, and community groups on topics related to soil conservation, native plants, and eco-friendly gardening. She's also an adjunct professor at Keene University, and she instructs the Barnegat Bay Volunteer Master Naturalist course. Um, she is also um, very active in the Native Plant Society. She's co-leader of the Jersey Shore chapter. And, um, that, and um, she's going to be speaking tonight about soil. Don't treat your soil like dirt because soil is what we all trot on and try to keep out of our houses is actually the most, one of the most important things that we can, um, that we can nurture and uh, work on in our gardens. So, Becky, I'm delighted to turn things over to you. Um, by the way, just one more thing. Um, if you want to make um, Becky's link, she's going to be talking about some organizations that you might want to link to. Those links are in the chat. The, um, also, if you have comments and things, please put them in the chat. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, and we will answer them at the end. Thank you very much, Becky. Great. Thank you so much, Elaine. And thank you. Tom and Melissa and the Bergen Passaic chapter for inviting me here tonight to present my program, Don't Treat Your Soil Like Dirt, Building a Foundation for Your Jersey Friendly Yard. And thanks so much, Mike, for Ed, uh, monitoring the um, webinar for us. Much appreciated. And hello out there, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me this evening. I'm very excited to be here and share information about soil. And um, as Elaine said, my name is Becky LeBoy. I'm the Education Outreach Specialist for Ocean County Soil Conservation District. And the district, the soil district, um, is a regulatory agency, but I am very lucky to hold the education position, uh, the only one out of all 14 soil districts in the state that actually have um, an educator. Um, so I'm really happy to be able to go out and provide a lot of education programs, as Elaine said, to the community, scouts, schools, anyone who will listen uh, about soil and about plants um, and natural resources. And my uh, goal really is to um, try to influence uh, folks or inspire really others to make small but really important changes in their own gardening practices that will protect and enhance soil uh, resources and conserve water and really just kind of rebuild uh, backyard ecosystems that reflect the local native landscape that is so vital to a healthy environment. And one way that we do this is through the Jersey Friendly Yards Initiative. The Ocean County Soil Conservation District is a very proud partner in the Jersey Friendly Yards Initiative. Jersey Friendly Yards is spearheaded by uh, an organization called the Barnegat Bay Partnership. It's a federally funded organization. And uh, Jersey Friendly Yards is implemented by Barnegat Bay Partnership, by Ocean County Soil Conservation District, and in collaboration with Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Ocean County. Jersey Friendly Yards is actually a website, but it's also a movement. The Jersey Friendly Yards website offers information and tools and resources to assist you gardeners in creating a healthy landscape for a healthy environment. And everyone who's watching today, I invite you to join this movement to create healthy communities by creating your very own Jersey Friendly Yard. So what exactly is a Jersey Friendly Yard? Well, Jersey Friendly Yards come in all shapes and sizes. And of course, each yard has its very own unique soil properties, as well as its own water and light conditions that support a variety of different plants. And those plants can include everything from annuals to flowering perennials, ferns and vines and shrubs and trees and grasses all with a mixture of heights and a variety of textures and colors and with an emphasis on planting New Jersey natives. 
These plants provide wildlife with food and shelter and nesting material and places to raise young. A Jersey friendly yard supports wildlife. Jersey friendly gardeners are encouraged not to use chemical pesticides. More than 90% of all songbirds feed their babies insects, so they grow really quickly and develop very quickly and fledge quickly. And insects collected by the parent birds in a yard that's sprayed with harmful chemicals can be very harmful and even deadly to the baby birds, not to mention to our beautiful bees and butterflies and other important beneficial insects. A Jersey friendly gardener uses minimal chemical fertilizers and instead explores organic supplements such as compost. And water conservation is certainly a priority in a Jersey friendly yard. So planting drought tolerant species in the plant's preferred soil type and in the plant's preferred light conditions, um, plants can then better tolerate those harsh conditions that sometimes um, we encounter, especially our uh, hot and dry summers that we are experiencing more and more. And a Jersey friendly yard reflects the local natural environment in your area. So by planting species that are not only native to New Jersey, but native to your local region, you can boost your garden's success and help to repair our local ecosystems. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to share with you some of our Jersey-friendly yards, some inspiring gardens um, that our team has helped to plan and install. And this photo uh, showcases the Jersey Friendly Garden at the Ocean County Soil Conservation District in Forked River. And this garden features lots of different flowering perennials. And you can see here there's some blazing star and some purple coneflower and some coreopsis. And these plants provide food for pollinators in the form of nectar and pollen and even food for birds uh, in the form of seed uh, in late summer and fall and through the winter. And the garden acts like a sponge during rain events. So it soaks in any excess water coming off the building before it runs into our parking lot. And this very sweet little garden here was created by a Jersey friendly gardener. Her name is Jill. And it showcases lots of different plants, lance leaf coreopsis, there's our purple coneflower again, there's some salvia in there, irises, asters, goldenrod, and lots of other plants that provide color and texture and beauty, and importantly, pollen, nectar, seeds, and uh, species specific veg vegetation for caterpillars. Um, and a host of other invertebrates that meet, need that vegetation. And these plants receive full sun throughout the day and they thrive in Jill's uh, very dry and well-drained sandy soil. And here's Lisa's Jersey Friendly Garden. And Lisa is a member of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, as well as a Jersey Friendly Gardener. And she designed this small garden to capture rain that pours down um, from the downspout of the house before it runs down her sandy slope of her front yard. That rain can really scour that sandy soil and cause a lot of erosion. And she's growing black chokeberry, uh, beautyberry, turtle head. Uh, a lot of my favorites, there's um, foxglove beard tongue and coneflower, and she has full sun in her front yard. And here's Barbara. Barbara is a Jersey friendly gardener as well as a member of the Native Plant Society. And she's out here enjoying her yard. And her yard actually backs right up to a local park and wildlife refuge. So when she picked out her plants, she selected native plant species for her garden that mimic the surrounding native plant community. And those include switchgrass and Christmas fern, Eastern red cedar and bone set. And um, she has lots of visiting uh, wildlife in her yard, including one of her favorite um, animals, box turtles. 
And here's my front yard. I'm slowly reducing my front lawn and I'm replacing it with a native garden. Uh, starting with a very small bed that goes around an old dead tree, which has been converted into a woodpecker condominium. And I've planted some flowering perennials, including one of my favorites, Culver's root. Um, I've also planted mountain mint and early sunflower. And there's a coral honeysuckle vine that's climbing up the tree. And these plants uh, thrive in my sandy loam soil in full sun. And finally, here's Phyllis's Jersey friendly yard. And Phyllis is a member of the Native Plant Society and she's a Jersey friendly gardener. And she has converted her entire property front side and back into a Jersey friendly yard. And here you can see her uh, long headed coneflower. She has some beautiful wild bergamot and some prickly pear cactus growing there. Um, among so many other plants that attract and support pollinators and wildlife. So Phyllis and Barbara and Lisa and Jill and I, we all took one really important step before planting our gardens, which was, of course, to get our soil tested, to get to know our soil and the properties of our soil. Designing a successful Jersey friendly yard or a successful garden begins with an understanding of the basic elements that support plant growth, namely soil, as well as water and light. So tonight we are going to dig into the physical, chemical and biological components of soil. And we're going to look at water availability in soil and light conditions through the lens of a Jersey friendly gardener, Phyllis. And we're going to explore ways to create a healthy foundation for your garden. Phyllis's front yard was once completely lawn. It's hard to believe it's now so beautiful. And in uh, 2018, she participated in a Jersey friendly yards pilot program. She and nine other homeowners, several of whom I, I mentioned uh, in the past few slides, uh, they received some training, which basically consisted of learning about the Jersey Family Yards website. And um, they learned about uh, conducting a soil test. Uh, when I went to Phyllis's house for a site visit, uh, that's one of the first things that we did. We discussed ideas and options for her yard. She wanted to turn her lawn into an oasis for pollinators. And through the pilot program, Phyllis was provided with $150 worth of plants. Uh, but how would she know which plants to pick out? Which ones should she choose that would be most successful in her yard? Uh, this is one of the most important questions that we can all ask ourselves when we're starting our garden uh, or adding to our garden. Um, we all have our favorite species, but how do we know if they will be successful in our yard? When we go to the Jersey Family Yards website and we go to the plant database, we need to have a little bit of information about our soil first. Um, when we are purchasing plants out in the world uh, and we look at plant labels, Plant labels can provide some pretty important information to the gardener, such as preferred light conditions of the plant. And this label here for salvia, it clearly states at the top of the front of the label, full sun. And on the back of the label, it says more than six hours of daily sun, which we know to be the definition of full sun. And part sun, also called part shade, defines a plant that needs between three to six hours of daily sunlight and a plant that needs less than three hours of direct daily sunlight is considered to be a full shade tolerant plant. And plant labels often provide the preferred water conditions, whether the plant requires lots of water um, or just some moisture or if it can tolerate dry conditions. And this label offers that information in the care section uh, where it states drought tolerant, but prefers moisture. So what does that mean to the average gardener in terms of watering 
or in terms of selecting the proper place you plant it in your yard. So we are going to discuss water needs of plants um, kind of through the lens of what we will call soil moisture. But unfortunately, there is nowhere on this label uh, that says the word soil. So how does the gardener know what kind of soil the plant prefers? What kind of soil holds the appropriate amount of moisture? What soil pH level does the plant prefer? What nutrients in the soil are needed to support this plant's growth? And many gardeners do not know these soil conditions in their own yard or garden, so it's hard to match the plant uh, with the yard. Soil is a really important factor to consider when planning your garden and selecting plants. It's probably the most overlooked component, obviously overlooked by the, um, the uh, nursery and the plant label. Um, soil is where your plants will spend their entire lives. It is where they're going to find their nutrients, gather their water, form relationships with soil organisms, and even connect with other plants through their root systems. Much of their life supporting processes take place underground. So it's a really good idea to get to know your soil before selecting your plants. And so Phyllis and I, as I mentioned, we conducted a soil test. So Phyllis collected a soil sample and she sent it to Rutgers Soil Testing Lab to determine the soil texture and the pH and the nutrient content. And this photo is actually a screenshot of one of the pages, uh, web pages on the Jersey Friendly Yards website instructions and a video showing how to collect a soil sample and a worksheet and directions for actually mailing your soil sample to the Rutgers Soil Testing Lab. You actually mail soil uh, through the Postal Service. Uh, there are all the instructions and the video are all found on this page. And you can actually navigate, navigate there by going to our website. So that's jerseyyards.org. And then you click on the Create a Jersey Friendly Yards tab in the top ribbon and click on the eight steps to a Jersey Friendly Yards tool. And then you click on step two, start with healthy soil. And I believe these links are in the chat. Um, you can also uh, Google Rucker Soil Testing Lab to find all of this information, and I believe that link is also located in the chat. As I said, one of the soil tests conducted was to determine the soil texture of Phyllis's soil. Soil texture is a physical property of soil. There's chemical, physical, and biological properties, and soil texture is a physical property. And it refers to the percentage of sand, silt, and clay that her soil contains. Sand, silt, and clay particles are categorized according to the size of the individual particle. Why does soil texture matter to the gardener? Because the size of the soil particle relates to its surface area and the surface area affects the size of the pore spaces between individual particles. And this determines the amount of water the soil can hold. This can affect drainage, aeration, and erosion potential. The soil particle size can also affect the amount of nutrients that can be stored in the soil. Soil texture can also affect the types of organisms that can live in the soil, which can affect the breakdown of organic matter. They can affect the soil's pH. They can affect the water holding capacity of the soil and the nutrient availability. Sand, silt, and clay are labels that are given to soil particles, as I said, based predominantly on their size. 
sand particles are between two millimeters and 0 0.05 millimeter, millimeters, so pretty small, but you can see a soil uh, sand particle uh, with your naked eye. I'm sure if you've gone to the beach, you can actually pick one up, you can roll it between your finger and your thumb, you can actually see and feel one single grain of sand between your fingers. A silt particle is between 0 0.05 millimeters and 0 0.002 millimeters. So you're going to need a microscope to see an individual silt particle. And clay particles, they are less than 0 0.002 millimeters. So individual clay particles can only be seen by a very, very powerful electron microscope. And to offer a size comparison between those three different soil texture types, if a clay particle were the size of a marigold seed, a silt particle would be a large radish, and a sand particle would be the size of a large garden wheelbarrow. And then gravel, uh, that's the largest particle that's shown here. Uh, they're actually pieces of rock. Uh, they're larger than sand, and they're not considered to be a component of soil. Sandy soil, as I'm sure you know, feels very gritty when held in your hand and when you kind of grind it between your fingers. Between each sand particle is space called pore space. Sand particles are just small enough to hold some what we call capillary water in this pore space. Capillary water can move upwards against gravity, but gravity has a great influence on the water that's trapped in these relatively large pore spaces between the sand particles, and most of the gravitational water drains out relatively quickly from sand, leaving lots of air within those pore spaces uh, between the different sand particles. And like sand, silt particles consist of weathered rock, uh, only much smaller in diameter. The texture of silt when you rub it between your fingers is like flour, like baking flour. Silt particles are spherical and the pore spaces between silt particles are much smaller than um, the pore spaces between sand particles. And silty soil holds a lot more capillary water than sand. The water contained in silt is also influenced by gravity. However, it takes longer for the gravitational water to drain out of a sample of silt. So whereas uh, sand and silt are formed as a result of weathering rock, clay, can also be formed by weathering silicate bearing rocks, but it takes place uh, through chemical action, such as carbonic acid, which are solutions of carbon dioxide and um, rainwater uh, eroding the rock. So clay is also formed during what we call intense hydrothermal activity, meaning in areas where there's water and very intense heat present. Clay soils have very, very small pore spaces between the tiny clay particles, and they have many more pore spaces in a sample than a sample of sand or silt. Clay particles have a great affinity for water. When clay comes into contact with water, it can absorb it and swell to double its size. Wet clay can soak up Ions, ions are elect uh, electrically charged atoms or molecules, and you know them probably as nutrients. Nutrients are ions. Like silt, clay particles have something called plasticity, meaning they can be molded and altered when wet. If you've ever um, held clay uh, that's wet, you can mold it into a, a clay pot and clay feels somewhat slippery when you rub it between your fingers. When clay particles dry out, they lose their plasticity and they may become very compacted and very hard. Soil scientists and gardeners can use something called the soil 
texture pyramid to help determine the texture of soil in your yard. And each of the soil textures on the pyramid um, are on the pyramid. They're sand, silt, and clay. You can see them at the corners. Um, they're represented um, in different percentages. Um, the percentages are all lined up around the outside uh, area of the soil texture pyramid. Uh, percentages go from zero to 100 in increments of 10. And then uh, overlaid on top of the soil texture pyramid, you can see somewhat of a grid in that triangle. And it's connecting all of those percentages between the soil texture types. Soils in our yards are typically a combination of sands and silts and clays. Soil scientists have determined that there's 12 major soil texture types, and each is represented in a different color here on this triangle. And in each of those three corners, we see our major soil types. There's sand to the bottom left, there's silt to the bottom right, and there's clay on top. Some of the texture type names consist of two words, such as uh, loamy sand. And some have um, three words, such as a silty clay loam. Um, these types, these words all describe the soil texture type that you're dealing with within that particular area of the triangle. And loam is a mixture of sand, silt, and clay in quantities that will equal somewhere in the very middle of uh, the triangle. It's that brown shape. And it can amount to somewhere between all of those uh, percentages that I laid out there. So somewhere between 22 and 52% sand, somewhere between 28 and 50% silt, and somewhere between 8 and 28% clay, plus a bit of organic matter mixed in. Gardeners have been taught, perhaps you've been taught, that you should strive for a loamy soil. Um, however, I'm going to tell you that uh, depending on where you live in New Jersey, you likely have uh, one of the sand or clay soils. Um, and that is okay. That is the important message that I want to tell you tonight. It's okay not to have loamy soil in your garden because our native plants are adapted to growing in our either sandy soils here in South Jersey where I live or perhaps clay soils up there in the north where you all live. The key is to select plants for your garden that are best adapted to the soil conditions that you already have in your yard. The soil texture triangle can be used in combination with the jar test to determine your soil texture type. So these tools are not just something I want to um, introduce to you and that's the end of it. I would love it if you would actually um, do a jar test in your garden and use the soil texture triangle to try to determine what kind of texture you have. So a jar test can provide an estimation of those percentages that you'll need uh, to use the soil texture uh, pyramid. Um, they provide the percentage of sand, silt, and clay contained in a soil sample. So what you'll do is you'll fill a jar about halfway or so with your soil sample that you dig from your yard and you watch that video um, from the Jersey Friendly Yards website or from the Rutgers um, Soil Testing Lab web website to collect your sample. And then you fill your jar um, about halfway with soil and then add some water and the water can go up to about three quarters or so of the way to the top of the jar, leaving a little bit of space so, so that you can actually put the lid on nice and tight and then shake it. Shake it really good and then let the jar sit still. And in about one minute, the largest particles, those sand particles are going to settle to the bottom. They're the largest and heaviest, um, so down they go first. Uh, in about two hours or so, you're going to start seeing the silt um, create a layer, the next layer. It's going to start settling out. Um, 
in about 24 to 48 hours or so, a couple of days, um, you're going to see that clay layer settle out. The clay actually takes a long time to settle because those teeny tiny little clay particles, they hold a negative charge and they are attracted to the positive uh, chemical ions in the water. So they stay suspended in the water for quite some time. And it really does take a couple of days, 24, 48 hours or so the clay particles to finally settle out. So using your jar uh, with the settled soil, you're then going to take a ruler and you're going to measure the height of each of the sand, silt, and clay layers. So let's pretend that this example shows 30 millimeters of sand, 22 millimeters of silt, and 25 uh, millimeters of clay for a total of 77 millimeters. You're going to turn your millimeters into percentages by dividing each amount by the total and then multiply by 100. So it's pretty, pretty easy math. If I can do it, you can do it. Um, so if your sample measured 30 millimeters of sand divided by 77 multiplied by 100, that equals 39% sand in your sample. Then 22 millimeters of silt divided by 77 multiplied by 100 is 29% silt in your sample. And then 25 millimeters of clay divided by 77 multiplied by 100 is 32% clay. Then use your soil texture triangle to determine the soil texture type. So here's that same uh, soil texture triangle, but without all the colors. So focus on the sand first. So find your 39% sand you had in your sample along the bottom of the triangle where it says percent sand and draw a line using the pattern of the grid and the slant of the numbers. So up to the left there. And then focus on the silt and find 29% along the right side of the triangle where it says percent silt and draw a line using the grid and the slant of the, the numbers. And then find 32% along the left side of the triangle where it says percent clay and draw a line using the grid. And where those three lines meet indicates your soil texture type. So in that sample shown, the soil texture type is called a clay loam. And when we um, tested Phyllis's soil, it was determined that Phyllis had a high content of sand, approximately 80% with approximately 10% of each clay and 10% of silt particles mixed in, not unlike many of us here in South Jersey, we have very sandy soil. And for her, this results in a soil texture somewhere between a sandy loam and a loamy sand. In Phyllis's Jersey Friendly Yard, uh, with her sandy loam soil, um, she planted some wild bergamot, one of my favorite flowers. It has a wide range of tolerance for a variety of soil conditions, including Phyllis's sandy soil. But if you have uh, clay or loam, you can plant wild bergamot and it will be successful in your yard as well. It also tolerates both dry and moist soil conditions, and it thrives in full sun, but it also does well in part shade. And Phyllis has planted several of these large, beautiful perennials as a pollinator-friendly hedge, um, a nice hedgerow in front of her house. And as members of the mint family, uh, they produce copious amounts of nectar, and so they're very attractive to native bees in all shapes and sizes. She has bees buzzing all over her yard and they're attractive to many other pollinators as well as hummingbirds. And Monarda blooms uh, throughout the summer from late June through July and August. This is wild bergamot. And mixed in with her wild bergamot, Phyllis planted Virginia mountain mint and purple coneflower 
two more flowering perennials that thrive in dry or moist, sandy, clay, or loamy soil in full sun or part shade. Here's black-eyed Susans in bloom. Uh, to the left is seaside goldenrod. It's not yet in bloom. And to the right is common evening primrose, also not yet blooming, but looking gorgeous over there. And back by the coneflower and the wild bergamot, she has a beautiful nine bark shrub. Uh, it flowered earlier in the summer and it's uh, starting to form berries here uh, on Phyllis's plant and the berries will be eaten by the birds. And in the front lining the street, she has irises growing and all of these plants she has growing are sun loving plants and they tolerate a variety of light conditions and a variety of soil texture types, and they tolerate dry or moist soils. She has spiky blazing star, Liatra spicata, one of my favorites. It has those beautiful spires of purple flowers, and this plant has some prime real estate right there in full sun. It prefers moist, rich soil, but it also tolerates well-drained dry soil. And I want to uh, talk a little bit about geography because geography plays a really key role in soil type. Where we are matters relative to the soil beneath our feet. So although we live in a very, very small state, soils in New Jersey are not all the same from north to south or east to west. Our northeast climate, our coastal position, our many rivers, lakes, and bays, our flat southern topography, and our relatively rocky northern hills and valleys, they all affect our soil type. And plants respond differently to different soil types. And they also respond different, differently to climate, to moisture, to sunlight, to other plants, to animals, to the microorganisms living in and around our soil. And these conditions differ depending on the location in the world and even within our very small state. And geology plays a really key role in soil type. The map to the left is a map of New Jersey showing its geologic features. Uh, South Jersey consists of relatively new sediment, which ranges in age from the Cretaceous period to the Holocene, which is between 135 million years ago to the present, and sediment consisting of quartzite sand, clay, green sand marl, which we have down here in South Jersey, and gravel were deposited as the ocean underwent transgression and regression, which is basically rising and falling, and, cont and uh, continues today. And North Jersey consists of very old igneous and metamorphic rock formations um, that were manufactured through various geologic processes. And the map to the right shows New Jersey's four main physiographic provinces or regions. And the boundaries of each province reflect the location of the main geologic features. And this lovely topographic map, I really enjoy maps. Um, this one overlays the borders of the physiographic regions, and it also points out some of the main peaks in the north. And depending on where you live in Bergen or Passaic County, you may be in the highlands or you may be in the Piedmont. The highlands um, is our most ancient province. It was uh, formed during the Precambrian era between 1 billion and 750 million years ago melting and recrystallizing sedimentary rocks were deeply buried, subject to pressure and high temperatures, creating metamorphic rocks such as granite, gneiss, schist, and marble. Granite and gneiss resist erosion and they create the highlands and belts of exposed sedimentary rock uh, were weathered to create the valleys and streams. A series of faults separate the Piedmont from the highlands. Sedimentary sandstone, shale, and conglomerate rock create a broad 
lowland interlaced with igneous basalt and diabase, which create the ridges and uplands formed during the Jurassic and Triassic ages. If you are interested in geology, um, I believe in the chat, there is a link to um, a wonderful website which offers more information about New Jersey's physiographic provinces and geology for you to read. Over very long periods of time, these rocks, the, the granite and the marble and the sandstone and all of those, um, they're referred to as parent material of soil. So they're weathered down and they're broken down into their very tiny mineral components. And depending on their hardness, um, it's a property of rocks, their hardness, or their ability to resist erosion, they can be weathered into smaller and smaller min mineral particles. And depending on the size of the particles, we categorize them as sand, silt, or clay. The sand, silt, and clay particles, they combine with one another, and they combine with organic matter, and they form what we call clusters of aggregates. And soil aggregates are groups of soil particles that bind to each other more strongly than they do to adjacent particles. The space between the aggregates provide different sized pore spaces for retention and exchange of air and water. The way in which aggregates are arranged is referred to as soil structure. Aggregation affects erosion. It affects movement of water and plant root growth. Healthy aggregates are stable against rainfall and water movement. Aggregates that break down in water or fall apart when struck by raindrops, they actually then release those individual soil particles and that causes the erosion. When soil is compressed, the soil particles move closer together, which can seal the soil surface and clog up those pore spaces. This blocks pathways for water and air to enter the soil and it restricts the emergence of seedlings from the soil, as you can imagine. Farming or driving on the soil when it's wet um, further exacerbates the problem, creating very compacted soil. Optimum soil conditions have a large range in pore size distribution. This includes large pores between the aggregates and smaller pores within the aggregates. The pore space between aggregates is essential for water and air entry and exchange. The pore space provides uh, zones of weakness, which is good through which plant roots can grow. And sandy soils have very low aggregation, we call it, but the roots and water can move readily. And soil with some clay content helps form the aggregates, uh, helps them to kind of stick together, but too much clay, of course, can then restrict the plant root growth. The amount of water, so we're gonna talk a little bit, bit about water moisture, the amount of water that is retained in a soil is referred to as soil moisture. So this is really important for our gardens. And we can define soil moisture as three main types. We can define it as dry or well-drained soil, meaning the water will percolate through quickly and water does not remain on the ground uh, very long at all after a rain event. And we have moist or medium drained soil, um, which is damp to the touch and occasionally saturated after a rain event. But moist soils remain wet within the rooting depth, even when the surface soil appear appears to be dry. And then wet soil is saturated much of the time and water can remain on the surface for very long periods of time. So let's think about the relationship between soil texture type and soil moisture. Uh, here's the soil texture pyramid showing the different soil texture types. 
And then these colors show the infiltration rate, meaning how quickly water passes into the soil for each soil texture type. Soils containing more sand are well draining, as you can see there in, in the blue. And the water will infiltrate and percolate through more quickly. Medium draining soil contains mixtures of sand, silt, and clay, allowing soil to remain moist for a little bit longer. As you can see, those kind of greenish and yellow orange colors. Um, the more clay the soil contains, its moisture retaining capacity increases. However, soils containing large amounts of clay may become too wet, preventing the water from infiltrating down and percolating down. And heavy clay soils can become saturated when water fills all those poor spaces um, that were once occupied by air. And then different plants, of course, are adapted to survive and thrive in different soil moisture conditions. Luckily for us, many plants, including this beautiful trumpet vine, can tolerate a very wide range of soil textures and soil moisture types and a range of light conditions. And this is actually called their range of tolerance. Range of tolerance uh, can be depicted on a graph for so many, many organisms, plants, animals, um, under lots of conditions. Most range of tolerance graphs are bell-shaped like this one with the optimum range near the very center of the bell. This graph shows range of tolerance of temperature. Stress on the plant occurs when the temperature reaches the extremes, meaning when it gets too hot or too cold. On this graph, slightly cooler than optimum still allows for a relatively healthy plant to the left there, uh, but slightly hotter than optimum is not acceptable for this particular species. Those plants are very wilty. So range of tolerance applies to soil texture conditions and soil moisture conditions, as well as light conditions. This little beauty right here, wood poppy, also called celadine poppy, has a large range of soil uh, texture tolerance, including sand, clay, loam, and organic rich soils. It tolerates part sun to full shade and dry to moist soil. It blooms in early spring and once the flowers are done, the foliage will continue to offer a lush green texture for your garden. Uh, if the plant receives too much sun in the summertime, the leaves will brown and wither. And I have several of these beauties planted in my own yard as well. Helen's flower and great blue lobelia both exhibit a wide range of tolerance to several different growing conditions. They can grow in full sun or part shade. They can grow in sand, clay, or loamy soil, and both grow in moist or wet conditions. Ferns also tolerate a range of partial shade to deep shade conditions. They grow in well-drained, sandy, loamy, and organic soil. And this species, Christmas fern, it, it grows in clumps. And in the springtime, these emerging fiddleheads are kind of a silver color, very, very pretty. And then they have very dark green leathery fronds um, when they fully open up. And that offers some really beautiful texture and shape in the garden. And in the uh, partly sunny, partly shady area of Phyllis's house, kind of closer to her woodland, the soil is richer with organic matter and she grows this beautiful rose mallow that thrives back there. Um, it can grow in either sandy or loamy soil. It prefers full sun, but it does tolerate part, uh, part sun, part shade. And it prefers well-drained to medium-drained moist soil, but it also tolerates uh, well-drained, dry soil. All right, let's turn our attention to an important uh, chemical property of soil pH. 
I'm gonna look at my time here. Oh my goodness, where does the time go? All right, it's already almost 8.30, so I'll try to speed through the rest of this. Um, pick out the important points. So here's uh, soil pH. It measures acidity and alkalinity levels of the soil. Um, different plants prefer different soil uh, pH. Uh, they have different tolerance for different ranges. Um, to the left is um, more uh, acidity, to the right is more alkalinity, and 7.0 is neutral. And what I want you to know about soil pH is that it actually uh, affects the um, availability of nutrients to plants. Uh, chemically speaking, nutrient molecules are affected by pH in a way that either gives the nutrients a free pass into the roots of a plant, um, or it kind of puts up a wall and blocks the nutrients entry into the plant's root. So this particular uh, graph kind of shows um, based on the acidity um, or alkalinity of the soil, um, the, it tells you the availability of that particular nutrient. So for example, between about 6.5 and 7.5, there's a little sweet spot there for phosphorus, um, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, um, but the accessibility of iron, uh, iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc are not available to the plant, even if they are in the soil. So when we did a, a test at Phyllis's house, her pH was 6.87. Um, that's considered very slightly acidic. Um, pretty much the sweet spot or at the upper range of um, optimum pH for, for many native garden plants. So some acid loving plants uh, include sheep laurel, swamp azaleas, mountain laurel, and this beauty right here, we just added this one to our Jersey Family Yards website. This is called Pearly Everlasting. It grows in slightly acidic, uh, neutral, and slightly alkaline soil and thrives in a, a range of soil texture, soil moisture, and light conditions. And it's also a host plant to American lady butterfly caterpillars. Here's a beautiful cut leaf cone flower, another one that survives in a range of um, soil textures, moist, soil mo moisture conditions, and light conditions, and supports lots of different pollinators, as does Golden Alexander, one of the most versatile um, plants out there, full sun, part sun, um, lots of different soil texture types, sand, loam, clay, um, very drought tolerant, also deer tolerant, um, a fast grower and black swallowtail caterpillars um, feed on this host plant. One of my favorites, false sunflower, also uh, thrives in a range of soil texture types, um, soil moisture types, uh, soil, a range of soil pH conditions, and offers lots of beauty and um, ecological benefit to pollinators. And then we did one last soil test that revealed uh, the nutrient levels in Phyllis's yard and her macronutrient levels um, were below optimum, but not excruciatingly low. So instead of adding chemical fertilizers, Phyllis decided to add organic matter in the form of compost. And this chart um, offers information about um, what nutrients do for plants and for us. And that brings us to the last um, soil uh, property, um, soil biology, which basically uh, refers to all of the different um, animals and organisms that live in soil and the, their importance to soil and their importance to plant growth. So this is a biological property. There's things called bacteria that live in soil. For every cup of soil, there's 200 billion bacteria, in fact. And for every cup of soil, there's a million meters of fungi, which are so important in the soil. In one cup of healthy soil, 
there's 20 million protozoa. And in every cup of soil, there are um, 100,000 nematodes and 50,000 arthropods. And one cup of healthy soil has at least one earthworm. So soil organisms basically consume and they process organic matter. The compost doesn't actually add nutrients um, right then and there. Those nutrients are locked within that organic matter. These organisms eat those um, pieces of leaves and different organic matter, and then they actually excrete those nutrients back into the soil. And while ginger loves to have um, a lot of organic matter and nice moist soil. Um, so those fallen leaves there provide a, a nice natural mulch that keeps the soil nice and moist, just the way that ginger likes it. Same with bloodroot, that it likes a nice organic rich soil, as does summer sweet. Summer sweet also has um, a nice range of tolerance for different soil texture, different light, different pH and has these really stunning, beautiful white flowers that bloom in the springtime and supports um, lots of beneficial insects, including these beautiful butterflies. So in conclusion, we're, we've reached the end of our tour of Phyllis's garden. I really want to encourage you all to think about the many different conditions in your own yard that affect uh, plant growth, most importantly, uh, soil, um, soil moisture, the water, and the light conditions. So once Phyllis understood all of those things in her yard, she turned her lawn into a beautiful Jersey-friendly garden and oasis for pollinators. So thank you very much for joining me tonight. I'm happy to stick around and answer some questions. Um, and thank you for your patience. And thank you. I had you. a lot to say. <laughs> that was very, very interesting. Thank you. We, we all need to be reminded of the importance of soil. But we do we do have some questions. Okie dokie. Um, the um, well, first one, very practical one. How do you get Jersey friendly yard signs? Somebody wanted to know that. How do you get those nice Jersey friendly yard signs? Is it is it like um, you know, is it like getting your garden certified? That is a really good question. And um, we actually just launched a Jersey friendly yard certification program this year through a small grant. And um, to all you folks up north there, I'm first going to apologize because this particular grant it's it's a pilot program. Um, we got some uh, funding from the DEP. When I say we, it's the Barney Bay Partnership got that funding. And then the Ocean County Soil Conservation District is subcontracting with them. Um, it's just for our particular watershed for this round. Um, but I don't want to discourage you to um, go onto our website under the um, resources tab. And at the very bottom, there's the certification program information. Um, certainly you are welcome to go through it and um, in the future um, we are definitely planning on expanding our reach. Jersey Friendly Yards is a statewide initiative but this particular certification program is just for the Barney Bay watershed but certainly you can follow all of those um, uh, wonderful gardening practices to um, certify your yard and eventually you know get signs and things like that that we're able to give away to our grant uh, beneficiaries this particular round so in the good question in the meantime no that's great and but in the meantime um we there are several programs that are open to people from this area in particular um bergen audubon the, um, the bergen county audubon society has a certification program that is excellent mm -hmm. they're more bird focused but if you do stuff that's good for birds you're doing stuff that's good for native absolutely. plants absolutely and for nature so yeah. that's a good one there's one from um from the north american butterfly association there's one from the xerces society there are are, there are numerous ones in National Wildlife Federation. So there are many ways to get your garden, um, your, your garden certified. I want to repeat that this was recorded. Um, is I think, I'm not sure if Mike's turned off recording, but this was recorded. So if you want to go back and look at some of the slides in detail, we had a questions about questions about that, you can do it. It will be on the um, it'll be on the YouTube channel. So um, 
there are a couple of questions and they're very good ones about if you're going to test the soil in your yard, how many different areas should you test? How should you decide where to test and how many different samples should you take? Yes, good question. Um, if you do go and visit uh, the page on the Jersey Friendly Yards website, uh, which offers that video, the same video is offered on a page at the Rutgers Soil Testing Laboratory. They kind of take you through how to take a sample. Um, if you're creating a, a garden bed, let's say in your front yard, you probably would want to take a, a sample from that particular garden space. And then if you uh, go around to let's say like Phyllis, the back of her house had very different um, conditions. It was a little bit more shady. There was a woodland there. So that soil type was um, just by looking at it, definitely a little bit different. Um, so a sample, um, we didn't do it for her, but certainly we could have taken a different soil sample there and sent that to Rutgers as well for testing. It might have come up a little bit different in terms of texture or even pH with all that organic matter in there. Um, so it really kind of depends on um, your particular situation. Um, perhaps your front yard was, you know, created with all lawn when your, your house was built and your backyard was kind of left in a more natural state. Um, so there's no really cut and dry answer to that. But when you do take a sample, let's say you're working in your, your front lawn and picturing Phyllis's all, you know, grassy front yard, we actually dug a couple of holes, at least three and, you know, six to eight to 12 inches, took a, a sample, uh, put it in a bucket, walked a couple feet away, took another scoop, put that in a bucket, walked, you know, to another area within that front lawn, took another scoop, put it in the bucket, mixed it, that all together to kind of get um, an average of that particular, let's say, 400, 500 square feet of space um, in her front yard, and then sent that to Rutgers for testing. And we would also take a little sample from that bucket, put it in our jar test and do a little shake and do that one at home as well. By the way, the jar test is just fun and you can do it with your kids. Yes. It's really fun because you really do see those layers mm -hmm. um, settle out. It's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we have a lot of questions about adding compost. So things like, how does it change the soil? Should you retest afterwards? Um, how do you, um, would you replant after you've been adding compost for a while? So um, we uh, just in general, what happens when you add compost? Yeah, so compost is uh, pretty amazing. Um, nature adds compost all the time because leaves fall from our vegetation, whether it's a tree or a shrub or, you know, your perennials in your garden, you're, if you, you don't clear it out, you're, you know, getting the benefits of what nature's providing all that compost. So um, the broken down leaves and organic matter are doing lots of different things. One, they're uh, in a way adding nutrients to the soil. Um, I mentioned in the, the slideshow that the nutrients aren't automatically uh, added, like as if you're adding fertilizer, they actually have to be extracted from those leaves. Um, the trees worked really hard to get the nutrients from the soil to bring them up to the leaves, put them in the organic matter that breaks down and goes down into the soil, but it has to be processed. So it's those organisms, you know, the protozoa and the nematodes and the earthworms, everyone's eating those, processing them, and then excreting the nutrients. And then the nutrients finally get back into the soil. So it does take some time. Um, also, the organic matter is really good at holding on to water. Um, holding on to nutrients uh, in the soil already. Um, so uh, it's kind of creating some stability. Um, it's um, uh, creating those beautiful aggregates. It's helping to kind of hold those soil particles together, especially if you have sandy soil like here in South Jersey, that organic matter is going to help it to hold together. The organic matter is going to actually invite more soil organisms. And when you have more soil organisms, they're excreting what's called exudate. So it's kind of like their uh, organism glue. And that helps to hold the soil particles, those mineral particles together and create those nice aggregates. So um, the organic matter is actually creating structure in the soil. Um, it also tends to buffer the pH. And when I say that, that's kind of a, a, a vague uh, way of saying that if you have soil that's a little bit too acidic or a little bit um, too alkaline, um, 
the uh, organic matter is going to, I'm not going to say neutralize, but just um, uh, kind of buffer out that soil uh, pH a little bit. Um, so it really does, a, a it, it serves a lot of different purposes um, when you add organic matter. You can kind of use it as fertilizer, you can add it in the spring, add it in the fall. Um, you can mix it in if you want to, but our kind of, our our new uh, mantra is don't disturb the soil. So mm -hmm. unless you're digging a hole, of course you need to do to put your plants in there. There's no need to till the soil or you know, move the organic matter into the soil, those organisms are going to naturally do that for you, whether it's, you know, visible earthworms pulling those leaves down into the soil, or just arthropods, you know, eating the leaves on the top and breaking them down into such teeny tiny pieces that they, you know, we're not out there watching it, but they do actually get, you know, deep down into the soil. Um, so, uh, all these processes are, are going to take place uh, if you add that organic matter onto the, the top of your soil. I'm it just going to cross, I'm gonna cross off the next question, which is, should you till? So uh, mm -hmm. then the answer is no, you shouldn't till. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like a massive hurricane or, you know, tornado going into the soil and disrupting all of those relationships that have been built by the mycorrhizae and the soil roots or the, the plant roots and the soil and the, the you know critters that are living there it's a complete disruption yeah um, so. it also releases carbon yeah the um very good question about how do you find out which type of soil each each species needs you did go through a lot of species and, and talk about you were um talking about um, plants that can tolerate a wide range of, of soil, but how do you find out more about, say you want to plant, I don't know, a rhododendron or something like that. How do you find out what it needs? Yes. Um, let's see if I can share with you. Um, I, really, I'm, I'm going to send you to the, the Jersey Friendly Yards website. Let's see if I have it available here for you. Can you see the website now? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. mm -hmm. so we have something called a Jersey Family Yards Plant Database. Um, if you've seen any of my other webinars on um, soil or plants, I try to take folks to the plant database and introduce them to it. Um, it's my favorite tool. See, I was just looking up Heliopsis. And when you get to this page, over on the left here are all the different search filters. Um, we have over 400 plants uh, in our database. And right here is soil pH. So if you get your soil tested and you, it's determined that you have slightly acidic soil, like many of us do, North and South Jersey, you can click on that and all the plants in our database that have been designated with slightly preferring slightly acidic soil or tolerating it uh, will pop up and then you can narrow down your search um, you know basically plant type is a good way to narrow it down I always like to look for perennials that I can add to my yard um, so these are all perennials that have slightly acidic soil and then you basically go from there if you have um, maybe very uh clay soil, you click that one. And so as you can see, it, it narrows it down, 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 down. So now we have 65 different species that are showing that are perennial. They can tolerate clay soil and they can tolerate slightly acidic conditions. Um, and then you can add on light requirements. Uh, maybe you have a partly shady area, partly sunny, partly shady. So you're gonna narrow down a little bit further. So it's our new one, our Pearly Everlasting, we just added recently to the website. So we're continuing, you know, we try to always add plants as much as we can. Um, and sometimes we'll get emails from folks and they say, hey, I know this really great uh, plant, native plant that I would love to have you add to our website and we'll do our best to do it. We'll certainly research it. Um, you can actually contact us. You can email us by clicking this little envelope right here. And um, my colleague, Karen Walzer, um, she is um, the Jersey Friendly Yards administrator. Um, this is her baby, this website. Um, she will uh, promptly answer your email. 
that somebody would like um, a better a, a definition of telling. We both use the term, but we didn't define it. And mm -hmm. I think that's very that good. That is a good question to define till. Um, She's I, specifically saying, what do you mean by no tilling? Okay, so really it's it's disrupting uh, maybe in gardener's terms versus farmer's ter terms. A farmer is going to certainly till the entire um, acreage of land and then plant the crops, which farmers are starting to, to do no-till farming nowadays. Um, for a gardener, I used to till my little teeny tiny little garden that I have out back with my little... Um, you know, roto till. Uh, I just thought it was the way things were always done, right? Until I learned that that's actually not really good. I'm, you know, doing all those things I said earlier, disrupting the soil. So, um, I'm I'm thinking like disrupting a couple inches, you know, within the soil. Certainly, uh, dig your holes to put your plants in there. You're going to have to do that, of course. Um, so I just mean, don't disrupt your entire ecosystem within your, your soil, you know, within your garden. Yeah, that's a good answer. I think one, one more question, um, cause I'm, I've been kind of grouping them. One more question, which I think is a very good one is, um, what, what if your soil becomes compacted? Is there anything you can do? Um, you may have to, depending on how badly it is compacted, you may have to till at that point just to kind of break up the compaction. Um, and then my favorite answer to all things is add organic matter. Um, that's going to um, uh, add some um, vegetative, you know, buffer inside the, the mineral um, soil. If you just have a lot of minerals that are all kind of compacted together and then there's no more pore space, the organic matter is going to take up some of that pore space um, so that the, the minerals aren't, uh, are separated, basically. I think I'm trying to just get down to the last couple of questions in my Computer doesn't want to scroll. So uh, um, I think probably that's all of our, that's our major questions. And um, I thank you very much. For oh, it was a lot of information. Yes. Thank you. Sorry yeah. I went so long. I looked at no, the No, 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 no. <laughs> Whoa. It was perfect, actually. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, everybody, please remember to register for the annual, for the spring conference, which is on um, Saturday, March 4th. And um, thank you again, Becky. It's been, it's been a pleasure as always. Becky will be one of the speakers at that conference. And um, the, you can, again, you can come in person or via Zoom and we will see you um, for our chapter next month on March 8th for Linda Rolliter. And thanks everybody for coming. Just one, one last thing, uh, oh, my presentation at the um, actual annual meeting, I had a question about this uh, offline, it will be different. So I won't be doing a repeat of this particular yeah. Yeah. Uh, program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. That's, uh, that's important. But thank you, everybody. And we're gonna- Thank I you. Thank, thank you, Elaine. You. Thank you to oh, your chapter for inviting my, me. Oh, it's Great. our pleasure. It's our pleasure. And thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, okay. And um, I think Mike is gonna- sign off. Again, thank Excellent. you, Mike, from the, from the Native Plant Society for monitoring. There he is. Okay. All okay. right.